are we doing? I am so excited that you are joining us here today. My name is Sarah. I work for California State Parks here on the beautiful central coast of California in the Ocean of Dunes district. And I have the privilege of joining you today from Pismo State Beach Monarch Butterfly Grove. So you'll see my monarch friend behind me. I have a few things behind me that we're gonna get to in a second. But today we're gonna talk all about the Western Monarch Butterfly. We're gonna start by talking a little bit about our beautiful grove that you see here behind me and above me. We're gonna talk about the monarch's migration and what it means to migrate, how they do it, how they know where to go, when they do it. We're gonna talk about the infamous life cycle of a monarch butterfly. It is a magical process. We're gonna dive into that a little bit later in the program. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about specifics of a monarch butterfly, maybe how to tell a male and a female apart. So hopefully that sounds good. But before we jump in to our butterfly content, I just wanna tell you a little bit about what we do here at Pismo State Beach Monarch Butterfly Grove in the interpretation department. So as an interpreter or as somebody that interprets, it is our job to communicate the language of the beautiful natural world to people like you. So we are one of 280 state parks and I hope when the time's right and it makes sense, you will come visit us or other local state parks, learn as much as you can about the natural world around you. So let's go ahead and get started with the history of our beautiful grove. So there are two types of trees that exist here in this grove. One is the blue gum eucalyptus. This is a non-native species, which means it does not grow here naturally, but it is vital, so very important, to the health of our monarch butterfly population in our grove. We also have what's called a Monterey cypress. Now there's not one behind me, but I'll go ahead and put one in the video here. I'll be doing that throughout this video, putting pictures here and there to help you understand things that I can't necessarily point out to you right now. So these blue gum eucalyptus trees and the Monterey cypress trees work together to create what we call the perfect habitat. And maybe habitat is a word you've learned before, but the best way I like to think about it is a home. So our monarch butterflies like to make their home in this habitat because it's comfortable and it has what we call a microclimate that they are really attracted to. And a microclimate is not too hot, not too cold. This grove provides that microclimate that they're looking for. Are we ready? Are we ready to jump into migration? I really hope so. This is my favorite topic to teach because it is truly magical. So what's important to start out with is that migration simply means to move. That's the way I describe it as simple as possible. It's movement. But if we want to get fancy with definitions, it's the seasonal movement of animals or insects from one region to another. So it's the relocation of animals from one region to another. So you might say, okay, we get it. Monarch butterflies migrate, but tell me a little bit more about where they go. And in order to do, to do this, I do like to use a map that explains how this works. So our butterflies start here in Pismo State Beach Monarch Butterfly Grove. They join us here from November to February. We have our highest numbers typically from December, January. It's a pretty beautiful, magical thing to witness if you ever get the chance. But our butterflies will take off in February. Our females will take off in search of a plant that is very important to the Western Monarch population. It is called milkweed. Now this plant is absolutely vital. It is the only plant, milkweed, that the females will lay their eggs on. The only plant that the caterpillars will eat. So it's extremely important. So in February, starting their migration, our population will leave the grove and they'll head in search of milkweed. Those, the females will go ahead and do that to lay their eggs and the males will die shortly after. Now the females will lay their eggs. We're gonna talk about the life cycle a little bit more, but those eggs will hatch, have other little baby caterpillars that will turn into monarchs that will fly further north. And this will happen in what we call generations. So it takes four to five generations to get from Pismo State Beach, where we are now, 
up to the Pacific Northwest in Canada. That's their final location for the Western population. That's where they're headed. So four to five generations that takes to get back up to Canada. Now this is where things get a little crazy because every four to five, we have what we call a super generation. And this super generation's job is to make its way all the way from the Pacific Northwest down to us here at Pismo State Beach, Monarch Butterfly Grove. Those ones are living a lot longer. Instead of four to six weeks, the super generation is living for six to eight months. And they make that thousands and thousands of miles journey south to us here at Pismo State Beach. It's a pretty remarkable process. And I do want to point out something that's interesting is we have an Eastern population of Monarch Butterfly and a Western. And these are split up onto two teams. You can think of it as split up into two teams based on the Rocky Mountain Range. So the Rocky Mountain Range separates our Western Monarch Butterfly, the ones we see here close to the Pacific Ocean, from the Eastern Monarch Butterfly. The Eastern Monarch Butterflies are doing something a little different. They're not exactly going to the same places and they will actually be traveling all the way down to Mexico. So it's a pretty amazing process and these wings, these ones are huge, but the baby wings that we actually see on a monarch butterfly, those tiny delicate wings are capable of so much. It's so incredible. Now you might be asking, okay, so they're, they're migrating. How in the world do they know how to do this? And the way I like to explain this is just two simple things. They, they're very intuitive. They're very sensitive. They can sense a lot. They sense a change in temperature it's very important to them. They're always wanting to find the warmest weather because they can only fly when it's 55 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. So they're always looking for that warm weather, which luckily we have here at Pismo State Beach, Monarch Butterfly Grove on the central coast of California. But they're looking for that change in temperature. That's one signal that it's time to move or migrate. And then they're looking for the change in the length of a day. So as it starts to get colder, a lot of times our days will get shorter and in the summer, our days will be longer and more spread out. Now this is something I definitely notice because I want to have as much daylight as possible. And it is safe to say that our monarch butterflies notice these changes as well. In order to navigate or as, you know, maybe maps, I like to think of their antenna. They have these really cool antenna. Maybe you've seen them stick up. They're very sensitive. They almost use them to smell is how we explain it. And I like to think of one antenna as a clock and one as a compass. Even though that's not the case, that's how they use them. So they're able to tell when it's time to go and where they need to go, which is insane because if you sent me to Canada without any directions, I guarantee you I would have some problems getting there. Absolutely. So that's a little bit about the Western monarch butterflies migration. Now moving really quickly into the life cycle. This is the, this is the meat of the program today. This is what's, everything about these creatures is amazing, but the life cycle is what really, really gets me. So please enjoy my friend, the butterfly, the beautiful grove. I'm going to grab these posters here that help us explain our life cycle with some fun graphics and images. All right, so as I said, let's go ahead and start in the grove with this life cycle. Let's say a female butterfly, a beautiful one, leaves the grove in about February. And she's gonna leave in search of this plant I talked about. It's called milkweed. Now they use their feet to detect milkweed. It's really important, as I said, this is really the only, the only plant that monarchs will lay their eggs on. I mean it, they're very picky. And they use these feet to taste not really, but to taste which plant they're on or feel out which plant they're on. So let's say this female, we'll call her Brenda. Brenda goes ahead and lays her egg onto this milkweed plant. So here's Brenda, she's getting ready. She's jazzed up. She's ready to do it. She lays her egg after detecting the milkweed. Her antenna are in a forward position. She's laying an egg on the underside of a milkweed leaf. This is what's super important. The underside of the milkweed leaf is where Brenda is going to decide to lay her egg. And if I asked you why, I have a feeling you might guess it's because she doesn't want things to see it. She wants to protect her egg. The answer is absolutely correct. You would be correct if that's what you said. 
she's gonna lay her egg on the underside for protection. Now, one female can lay up to 500 eggs, which is incredible. They're absolute superheroes, as I said. But this is Brenda's egg that she has laid under on the underside of this milkweed leaf. And this egg, although it looks really zoomed in because we have these awesome posters, is only the size if you took a pen and maybe just made a dot with the tip of the pen, that's as big as it is. They're so, so tiny. So this is a monarch egg. It's fertilized and it's about the size as a pin head, of a pin hat, as I said, laid on the underside. Monarchs are super smart. They're gonna do everything they can to protect themselves and you're gonna learn a little bit more about it. So the egg hatches in three to four days. It's called the larva. And it eats 1 16th of an inch, or it is 1 16th of an inch long. And what it will do first is actually eat its eggshell. So it's a super tiny caterpillar, definitely much less than an inch long. And the first thing it's gonna do after hatching is eat this eggshell. It's gonna do this for two reasons. The first being for nutrients. So you and I have to eat too. We have to, we have to really get nutrients into our bodies to be healthy. Same with caterpillars. They're gonna eat that shell. The second reason is because if I were a bird looking to eat a caterpillar, I guarantee you if I saw a shell, I would think, wow, pretty good chance that uh, Brenda's Brenda's baby is gonna be right there. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a, a caterpillar nearby. So they actually do it for protection. Super, super ingenious, if you ask me. And this is what an adult caterpillar looks like. This is the biggest that a caterpillar is gonna be. It has all these really cool colors. These caterpillars are amazing. They feed only on the milkweed plant. So that's why I said milkweed is so, so important. And the reason that they have these bright colors, I wanna take a moment to point this out. The wings of a monarch butterfly and the colors of the caterpillar in its larva phase and its caterpillar phase mean something. And as an animal, typically in the animal kingdom, the insect kingdom, the brighter things are, the more of a warning sign they are to predators. So if you have bright colors in nature, we like to say that you are warning predators or things that might wanna eat you that you could potentially be toxic. Now milkweed has toxins in it because it's the only plant the caterpillars eat. Caterpillars are toxic. And because these monarch caterpillars turn into butterflies, so are the monarch butterflies. So it's actually a warning sign. It's like, hey, do not eat me. Go find something else to eat because you are going to have a hard time if you eat me. Now within the, within the time frame of about two weeks, our monarchs will will grow in size 20, excuse me, 2,700 times their original size. So they are multiplying in size in such, in such a crazy, crazy fast way. It would be as if in two weeks, a baby, like a human baby is growing to the size of a blue whale. That is how fast they are growing and how much they're eating. They're gonna molt their skin. And of course, as I gave you away with eating the egg, they're gonna eat their skin for the same reasons. Nutrients and predators are less likely to find them if they eat that skin. It's what we call the exoskeleton. And as they grow, they're shedding these exoskeletons. It's gonna shed its skin about five times in 15 days. So that's something good to know as well if we're looking at time frame. They have these beautiful chewing mouth parts. Here they are munching on the milkweed. Super important. And now things get a little bit exciting. So Brenda's baby is going to find a sturdy twig. It's gonna find a sturdy twig. You know, it's, it's done, it's growing, and it's ready. It's like, you know what, I think I'm ready to, to make this happen. So it's gonna find this sturdy twig after about the 15th day. It's gonna spin a silk button, which you can see here, that little orange guy right there up at the top. They're gonna spin that silk button on a strong twig on the milkweed plant. And then it's gonna insert a hook or what we call a cremaster, which develops on its rear into the silk button and hangs down in the shape of a J. So we call this a J hook. I wonder why, probably because it looks a lot like the letter J, you would be correct. So that's, it's getting ready to metamorphosize to get into that butterfly condition. And this is what we call its chrysalis. So let me put down my J sign here and show you 
its chrysalis. So what it's gonna do is the caterpillar sheds its skin one last time and creates this beautiful jade green chrysalis. And you might be saying, Sarah, I'm pretty sure that's a cocoon. And what I would have to say to that is, butterflies form chrysalises and moths form cocoons, even though it looks a lot like a cocoon. But it's a really beautiful jade green color. It has these crazy ornate gold dots. It's so special. It's amazing to watch. So this chrysalis stage, after the final molt, the caterpillar begins the pupal stage. This chrysalis measures less than one inch. So these look huge, but it's very tiny. This is happening on a much smaller scale. Inside the chrysalis, a dramatic change is taking place and the body of the caterpillar dissolves into what we like to call a living soup. Now, the, what a living soup is, is a rearrangement of the caterpillar's body cells. They're reassembled into a new and different kind of body, which you might recognize as an adult butterfly, actually. And this word is metamorphosis. It really means to change. Or, and it takes place over nine to 15 days. So they're hanging out here for anywhere from nine to 15 days in that metamorphosis phase, which is a super fun word for to change. Now this is where things get a little crazy. Soon thereafter, the adult monarch begins to emerge in an upside down position, as you can see. Notice how the chrysalis has spit, split down the side, excuse me, so the butterfly can do what we call e-closing. That means coming out, it's time. So it splits, it turns clear and it splits down the side and this is where, this is where things get good. Our butterfly emerges. It emerges. It's such a, such a crazy process. I just genuinely cannot believe it happens. The emergence, after the emergence, the butterfly will hang upside down in its old chrysalis and its large abdomen. So this right here is its abdomen is filled with fluid that it then needs to pump to its wings because once it comes out of the chrysalis, it's not ready to fly right away. It needs to pump that fluid. It needs to dry out. It needs to be 55 degrees or warmer. And so those wings are going to expand as it pumps the fluid from its abdomen into its wings, these veins, those black veins you see. And it's gonna just, it's just gonna dry out. And it's an absolutely beautiful process that results in our incredible, incredible Western monarch butterfly. It's such a cool story. And now that I have this picture up, I'm gonna take a second really quickly to describe to you the difference between a male and a female. And this is super interesting because if you ever decide to visit our grove, you can easily tell your friends or your family or whoever you're with, oh, that's a male and that's a female. And I guarantee you they will be so impressed. So let's make sure I've got this right here. This is a female. This is a female butterfly. And the way that you can tell is it has a little bit of thicker veins here. These black lines are going to be more thick than our male who's a little thinner. So our male on the bottom there has a little bit of thinner lines. And it's definitely tricky to tell if you're just looking at the lines, but the dead giveaway, what really helps me, is these two black dots on the male's body. These two black dots symbolize that it's going to be a male Western monarch butterfly. This female, as you can see, does not have those same black dots going on. Alrighty everyone, so now that we are experts on how to tell the male and female butterfly apart, we're just going to do a little bit of review and then I'm going to send you off. Thank you so much for joining me here. Thank you so much for learning about this habitat, about this microclimate, about this sensitive population of monarch butterflies that are migrating and changing and going through metamorphosis. It's incredible. They're finding that right habitat, that perfect microclimate. They have these wild adaptations that help them better to survive and adaptation is a change. So they're changing with their environment to survive among their environment better. Um, it's, we learned that milkweed is so important. I know I talked a little bit about it, but certain plants are so vital to the health of certain animals. It's really a testament to how connected our ecosystem is. So if the amount of milkweed is decreasing, the amount of butterflies is going to be decreasing. They, butterflies are what we call pollinators. So they pollinate different plants and that's what we call a mutually beneficial relationship. And you might be saying, Sarah, 
what do you even mean? And my answer is that it means both things, both the plant and the butterfly in this case, are benefiting. They're getting something good out of this deal. So these butterflies will land, they will drink nectar, that's their, that's their reward. They're drinking this sweet nectar from flowers. Meanwhile, their feet are landing on flowers, going to other flowers, and allowing that reproduction to happen. So the plant's happy because it's living on, creating more plants similar to itself, flowering, budding, all of that good stuff. And then these butterflies are getting that nectar that they need for energy. So it's a mutually beneficial relationship. It's really, really incredible. I think that about does it. I really do for today. And I'm so, I, again, I'm so thankful that you decided to join us today. I have a little bit of a call to action for you. I do like to end all of my programs with a call to action. Now, this is a very sensitive species. And as a human, what we do really matters to a lot of the plants and animals around us. So what I can tell you is just educate yourself. The fact that you listen to this program is such a good start. You now know about these monarch butterflies. You can continue to research them and maybe develop, develop a liking for them or some sort of empathy for them. So you are able to do the things that might help protect these species and so many others. Again, my name is Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Pismo State Beach Monarch Butterfly Grove with me and my friend here, and we will see you next time. Have a beautiful day. To learn more, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media. You can also check out our content on Padlet. Thanks so much, and see you next time.